All right, so what we're going to start off with is our hydrophobic pathways. But what we've got to be really mindful of throughout all of this is that we're thinking about it in the context of signal transduction. So as we go through, we've got to section this into three main stages, reception, transduction, and response. We're going to start off, obviously, therefore, with our reception of a hydrophobic messenger molecule. Um, we have to know it more generally, but the main example that's provided typically in questions in VCE is through steroids or the movement of steroids across a membrane or um, to be received by a cell. So what I've got here in this diagram is, of course, a steroid. Hopefully, at this point, you're aware that steroids are hydrophobic because they themselves are made up of lipid derivatives. And so that means that they are, of course, lipophilic. As they are hormones, examples of hormones too, they're going to come through the bloodstream. As they're lipophilic and most of our blood is made up of water, they've got to have a carrier protein, which ensures that they remain soluble and therefore can get around the body. Once they get to the cell, though, they're going to come up to the cell membrane. That's the first section that they're going to arrive at. If we zoom into this section here, so we think also about our area of study one um, in RVC bio course, then you hopefully are already aware of this structure. What I'm obviously drawing here is our phospholipid bilayer. We have our phosphate heads, our lipid tails, and this is according to the fluid mosaic model. So these um, phospholipids are not going to be static in this arrangement, but what is always going to be um, apparent is that the center section, the center section made up of lipid tails, is going to be hydrophobic. Okay, the lipid insert, um, inside section is going to be hydrophobic. These phosphate heads are the opposite in that these sections, they are hydrophilic. This means particularly because all of the area inside and outside the cell, so both the intracellular and extracellular environment, is predominantly made up of water. The real question is whether a substance can move directly through the membrane. It therefore has to be hydrophobic to do so. So to be able to move directly through this lipid bilayer, it has to be hydrophobic. This means our steroids, for example here, um, is able to move directly through the membrane. And that is one of the key differences between a hydrophilic and a hydrophobic pathway. So this messenger molecule can move through the um, phospholipid bilayer as it's attracted to those lipid tails. And when it gets through, it's going to diffuse and move around the cell until it finds its complementary receptor protein. When we're talking about receptors or proteins in general, the complementary nature of them is going to be that tertiary slash quaternary structure. That's the part of the protein that is going to attach to the molecule, and it has to have its amino acid R groups in an arrangement that is complementary to the size, shape, and charge of this messenger. So we then get here our ligand receptor complex. All that complex means is that they have come together, they are now as one, and when that happens, there is actually a change in shape. Okay, so there's a conformational change, and that will again be our tertiary or our quaternary structure, and that results in the exposure of this DNA binding region. Okay. This occurs on all hydrophobic pathways. Your messenger molecule moves directly through the plasma membrane. It's then received, so reception occurs when it comes into contact with its complementary receptor. There's a conformational change, and that exposes a DNA binding region. At this point, we move into transduction. So when the changes start occurring in the cell to come up to that ultimate response. What happens in this case, as we've got this DNA um, binding region is this molecule then moves into the nucleus. What happens is gene expression and hopefully through area study one you've already learned the steps and processes of this. So transcription, RNA processing and then translation at the end. If you want a video on this let me know um, but otherwise it's assumed knowledge at this point in the course so I'm going to move straight on to what's the product of this. We move through, our mRNA is transcribed by our ribosome over here our free ribosome, it's not embedded in an endoplasmic reticulum, and then we end up with our polypeptide chain. That polypeptide chain will have to undergo folding until eventually it becomes my very crude globular functional protein. And that functional protein for this hydrophobic pathway is our response. 
If we think about this process, our response is always it coming in contact with its receptor and the direct change that occurs. The transduction is then everything that occurs between there and the point where your response or your final product is produced, which in our hydrophobic pathways is the protein which is coded for by the DNA for which the receptor is complementary. Keep in mind here that we actually could have downplayed or um, repressed the expression of that gene as well, rather than increasing the concentration or the production of that protein. And it's really important, therefore, to read through the context of the question when you're given one such as this. Okay, so now for our hydrophilic pathway. Again, it's good to think of it in a context, and the main context that they give it to us in, in VCE is when we're talking about protein-based hormones. Now, our protein-based hormones are typically hydrophilic and therefore as they also go through the bloodstream they do not require a carrier as they are already hydrophilic they're happy to be in that water and so they move around until they come up to a cell which has their complementary receptor protein okay so here we do have a complementary receptor remember the, these are all proteins and so what is complementary is the tertiary or quaternary structure when that um, messenger molecule does bind with our receptor, we're going to, just as we see in the hydrophobic pathway, see a conformational change. That conformational change is going to be for this receptor, both on the outside, that extracellular portion of the protein, but also the intracellular portion of the protein. So the part within the cell. Ultimately, we know that this protein-based hormone is hydrophilic, and therefore it can't pass directly through the plasma membrane due to the lipid tails. Proteins like this are also quite large, so they could potentially go down channel proteins or otherwise would have to undergo endocytosis. Endocytosis, though, is very active and also would break around the breakdown of the vesicle once they were in. It's not a very effective or efficient way for the message to be carried so instead we have what we call the first messenger okay we've got the first messenger which attaches to the receptor on the extracellular side of the plasma membrane that then undergoes a conformational change in the tertiary quaternary structure and i'm just going to adjust this little diagram here because that's not a receptor itself what this one here is is a membrane bound enzyme okay so this membrane bound enzyme again made up of protein it can have tertiary and quaternary structure potentially um, and the conformational change actually activates this enzyme that means that a reaction is going to be catalyzed the reaction in this case that's catalyzed is a production of secondary messengers it's really important that you know this term this is another way other than the fact that the receptor is on the membrane rather than within the cytosol Another way that these two pathways differ, that we have our one first messenger, and then once that activates an enzyme, you actually get tens of thousands of these secondary messages being produced in the cell. We don't need to know um, the specifics of all of these. You will see these are described as CAMP, cyclic AMP, um, but as I just stated, we don't need to know the specifics of this pathway as is stated explicitly in the study design. These tens of thousands of secondary messengers actually go on to activate other key enzymes. An example of those are kinases which cleave, so basically chop up other proteins. This continues, you get a cascade, we actually do call this a cascade, an enzyme cascade where we have an original signal of one messenger molecule to tens of thousands and onwards. Okay, this enzyme cascade results in a little bit like a megaphone where you have a small signal being originally sent out and then you've got a giant message being emitted later on. Okay, so this enzyme cascade and what it's actually doing is amplification. So this small message is then getting shouted or sent all around the cell. Those key enzymes can go on to do many, many things. So they, for example, could cleave other proteins or activate enzymes that already exist in the cell. An example of this would be procaspases, which then lead to apoptosis. Okay, you can learn about that um, in the next stop point. They could activate enzymes. They could also do the exact same thing as our hydrophobic pathways, where they could alter gene expression. The difference, another difference between these two pathways is that our hydrophilic does not have to alter gene expression, but it can, it can um, produce just like with our hydrophobic, could be a structural or a regulatory protein. Those proteins will go on and do whatever they're sent to. 
Really, the key difference or the key idea for hydrophilic is that there can be a range of changes to cellular processing or cellular processes. So between these, if we consider, we've got our reception with our hydrophobic pathway. Reception happens in our intracellular environment, whereas for our hydrophilic, it's extracellular. Transduction is always going to differ regardless or for each of the different pathways. However, a hydrophobic is very simple. It's just gene expression adjustment, whereas a hydrophilic involves the activation of secondary messengers and an enzyme cascade to amplify. Now for a quick summary of this. Our main um, differences between the two pathways include site of reception, complexity of transduction, and possibilities for possible cellular responses. For both of the second two, um, obviously hydrophilic is more complex, and just outlining some of the keywords that I really want you to make sure that you have under your belt following this secondary messenger, okay, a enzyme cascade, the idea of amplification in our hydrophilic, okay, being really on top of intra versus extracellular as words, and being specific whenever you talk about it, um, of a confirmation or change in tertiary or quaternary structure, and finally our DNA binding region I think is important for you to understand. At this so thank you for watching this video on hydrophobic and hydrophilic signal transduction. Make sure to like and comment below if there are any videos you'd like us to make about PCE biology.